Welcome to another episode of We Don't Die. I'm your host, Sandra Champlain, author of the international best-selling book called We Don't Die, A Skeptic's Discovery of Life After Death. And this is a special video episode. So if you're list- listening on your favorite podcast channel and you'd rather be viewing, simply go to YouTube and type in We Don't Die Radio. As a reminder, our home base is wedontdie.com, where you can now find over 400 hours of episodes about the afterlife. And also, we now offer psychic and medium classes, demonstrations, and we have a free Sunday gathering, which is our non-denominational Sunday service and included is evidence of the afterlife as we do a medium demonstration as a part of each and every one. Our guest today is our friend William Peters, who's the founder of the Shared Crossing Project and director of its research initiative. Recognized as a global leader in the field of shared death studies, he has spent decades studying end of life experiences. William has worked as a hospice volunteer with the Zen Hospice Project in San Francisco and as a teacher and social worker in Central and South America. A practicing psychotherapist, excuse me, he holds degrees from Harvard's Graduate School of Education and UC Berkeley. William is the author of the brand new book called At Heaven's Door, What Shared Journeys to the Afterlife Teach About Dying Well and Living Better, published by Simon & Schuster. You can find out more about William and his work at sharedcrossing.com. William, welcome to We Don't Die Radio. Thank you, Sandra. Great to be back. I uh, oh. always love talking to you. It just makes me smile, as you can see. So <laughs> I'm a we have many, too. many dialogues, many. Uh, oh, we miss this with the COVID era. We don't get to see each other as we used to on the circuit. So I know it's been a couple of years. I first met you at the AREI symposium, I think. That's right. I yes, think you that's did. when I first laid eyes on you and I knew I had to share your story. But since we first met till now, you've done a lot. I had interviewed you four years ago, and there's so many new listeners and now viewers that I have on my show. So I'm going to ask you to retrace the steps and talk about you and a little bit about your history before we get into Shared Crossings and the new book. Thank you. You know, a a question that um, I often get, and you were kind of leading up to it, was, you know, how did you get into this work? Um, And I I am pretty sure that my near-death experiences set the stage for my interest and uh, fascination uh, with the shared death experience. And, you know, just to be more clear about it, when I was 17, uh, I had a high-speed skiing accident and was... Basically, as soon as I, you know, hit the snow, I was catapulted out of my body. And the next thing I remember was looking back at my, my body in the snow as I was sailing away from it. And it was in Squaw Valley uh, outside Lake Tahoe. So I could see the beautiful lake. And then I saw the Sierra Nevadas and then the continental U.S. as I was, I was completely comfortable, very much at peace. And it was like natural it was just comfortable. There was nothing at that moment that was uh, scary to me at all. So in that experience, I had a life review. Then I went through this rib tunnel and I ran into the light, which is so common in the NDEs. And it was beautiful, you know, loving, but pretty uh, ominous light. Like it was God in my eyes. It was powerful. And I pled with this light to come back, which is not a common NDE uh, experience. Most are pretty happy to be there, but I was so clear, I am not done yet. I, I, and I was kind of arguing with God, not that God was really responding to me. Uh, I was just kind of pleading my case over and over again. It's not uh, my time. So, yeah, more time, more time. And, and so uh, I, I, as I came back, I felt this pushback from this beautiful, uh, loving light. And I heard telepathically, make something of your life. And and that was profound. That has really stuck with me. So obviously I'm back. And I 
I lived after that, I went to college, had a pretty standard experience, but found myself committed to uh, social service work and teaching. And that wasn't my trajectory. You know, I was a, you know, upper middle class kid, well-educated, went, was in a fraternity actually in college. And uh, not that, not that people in fraternities don't do uh, social services, but it's not really the thing you get rewarded for. So long story short, I found myself in Central and South America. And later, I came back and worked during the AIDS epidemic uh, in San Francisco. And in the AIDS epidemic, I had my first uh, report that I can remember of an SDE. And that came from a gentleman who was helping. He was a gay man, and he was living in a community of, you know, really disenfranchised uh, men with AIDS. And they were largely ostracized from the community. So he shared this experience of me with me saying, um, you know, his, uh, I have to change his name. I won't even give you his name, but he came in and he was working with me. Uh, and I worked with him quite a bit, actually. And so he said one morning came in Haggard. I go, wow, what happened? What, what, what's up? And he shared this experience of being with his brothers, as he called them, as one of their, you know, one of their brothers was dying uh, of AIDS. And he said, I saw him rise out of his body into a cylinder of light. He stopped, turned back and looked at us all as we were holding hands and weeping and said, thank you to us. And I remember that experience and it struck me and I never had any doubt that it was real. So those were the early foundational experiences. I would have another NDE experience. I later worked in hospice, uh, Zen hospice, and had uh, an, an, a profound, I would call it a gateway experience uh, in the sense that I was just there reading a story to a gentleman who was very close to death and found myself uh, kind of popped out of my body. And there I was suspended with Ron. Um, that's I changed his name. And Ron, Ron was looking at me almost as if he welcomed me into this space to say, check this out. And I looked down at my body and Ron's body down below. Obviously he was in bed and I was sitting in a chair next to him reading. I don't know how much time I spent up there, but when I came back into my body, uh, that experience was with me. And I even shared it with a supervisor, a wonderful supervisor at Zen Hospice. And he said to me, uh, very Buddhist, William, uh, phenomena rolling by, let it go. And there's somebody who needs your attention in bed 12. And, and you know, this was an old uh, you know, San Francisco General Hospital uh, hospice. So 24 beds, open ward, a lot of work to be done, a lot of people dying. I would have many more SDEs. But that was the one where it really taught me that, oh, I am not my body. And I've had these experiences before because I had two near-death experiences. And I was very accepting of it. There was no resistance. It just set a fire under me to, uh, to, to kind of affirm these experiences happened. But nobody was talking about them. And nobody was doing research. And then I met, uh, I was a trained psychotherapist. Uh, and But then I met Raymond Moody a decade later. And when I met Raymond, I was anticipating him talking more about the NDEs because I had had those and wanted to hear Raymond. It was a great opportunity. And lo and behold, he jumps right into the SDE and says, listen, I want to sh share another experience with you that is related to, in fact, I think it's identical to the NDE. It's called a shared death experience. And then he defined it. And I'll give the definition right now for your viewers, which is, a, a, a shared death experience occurs when a, a bystander, it's typically a loved one um, or a caregiver reports that they shared in the transition of the dying into a benevolent afterlife. And I say benevolent and I say afterlife because that's what they, that's the terminology we hear is that it's, it's an afterlife uh, and it's a, it's a good realm. It's a, comfortable, loving, I dare say, uh, sublime realm for so many of us who have visited. So uh, that's how I got into this. I mean, I will say that I talked to Raymond right there when he, I went up to him after he gave his talk. And I was, I was so excited because I, I was just like, I, you know, you get those chills running through your body. Like, 
Are you kidding me? He just talked about this experience. It has a name. And I told him and he said, um, well, what I told him was I've had these, I've had many of them. And I think I know how to make them happen. That's what I told him. I was really, I was really bold because I really felt like I knew this landscape. Yeah. And as it turns out, um, well, first of all, he was very supportive and Raymond has remained a supporter and quite kind and giving of himself and just pleased that someone's carrying the research forward because by his own admission, he, he feels like he's done his work and he appreciates his lower level of activity, shall we say. Uh, although we'll be doing an event with Raymond uh, because he wants to help bring this, uh, you know, he wants to bring this work out further for people. So with that being said, that's how I got into it. And we've done the research. I should say we've done the research. I started a research project entirely to understand and document SDEs. And, and that's really what we've done. And I'm quite proud of what my team has done because we have now placed uh, you know, our research in the leading uh, medical journals, one in particular, the American Journal for Hospice and Palliative Medicine, which is one of the top hospice and palliative medicine journals on the planet. So we now have a foothold there. There is now for all of us who end up in uh, medical facilities, we can say, you know, I encourage people and especially those who work in end of life in a variety of compassion, a, a variety of uh, capacities that you can cite this and say, hey, we need to talk about these in our, in, in our hospices and our medical clinics and ICUs and emergency rooms, wherever people are dying, <laughs> these need to be known. It's a super big deal. When I first met you and heard you present on this, like I had no idea that was even possible. I mean, I just thought this is huge. And getting that confirmation that Raymond Moody's got a working on it and writing about it and talking about it, it's amazing. And I remember, and if you don't mind sharing, maybe a couple of the stories of people that have had SDEs, shared death experiences, because you've already given me goosebumps three times in just this short time we've been together. So I know there'll be more, but it's a really, it's a, it's a big deal. Well, thanks. Uh, I appreciate that because, you know, I think those of us who really either advocate for and or really want people to know that there are so many spiritual experiences that happen, not just at the end of life, but after a death, before a death. And then of course, there's all these experiences with communication across the veil, which you know you or you and your organization have been wonderful at promoting with mediumship and such. All of this uh, points to a common, uh, I think, perspective of the universe, a cosmology, if you will. Uh, but to, to answer your question specifically about shared death experiences and those that we've researched, and I'll give, I'll give an example, I'll give two examples, actually, because they're quite similar from the book. And th what's spectacular about these two cases is that one of the women um, is in Australia, the other is in West Virginia. They both lost their, uh, a child at birth right at birth. And what they both report is that in the case of the woman from West Virginia, uh, Liz, she shares that as she is going unconscious and they're telling her she's being, you know, they're trying to keep her alive because she's hemorrhaging. They know the baby is, is not going to make it. And she sees her grandparents appear, four of her grandparents. And the message she's getting from her grandparents is, we've got your baby. We'll take it from here. Everything's going to be just fine. So that's her experience. And then you've got Michelle in Australia. Michelle also losing a child at birth. Um, and in this case, it's a son. And her father appears. And now he's deceased. And he's appearing. He's appearing for a number of days. Wow. 
So her baby was on life support. And this is a very interesting phenomenon. I'll, I'll finish the story that we'll talk a little bit about life support. But her father is there and she keeps telling her father, go away. I'm going to keep the baby's going to make it. And he keeps showing up and she gets it. He's come to assist her, take her child and let her know I've got it. Right. I'm going to, I'm going to care for your baby. I'm going to make sure he makes it home. These are two very similar experiences when you have deceased relatives up here and assist with the transition of a loved one. So th those are two from the book. Um, there are many more. We have 28. I have 28 that I've featured. And I go into a lot more detail because the relationships are so important. If there's one thing the shared death experience teaches us, it's really that we are so connected, that our loved ones on the other side are there to support us. And that all of us, when we depart this life, embark on another journey. And so it's that motif of connection and interpersonal relationship that transcends the veil and the motif of journey that we all go on when we leave this human life. So, yeah, and I, I, I mentioned that I'd say a little bit about life support. We have a, it's a little bit of a tangent, but we find that when people are on life support, that the deceased loved ones or elevated guiding, well, we call them, so we, I, I've identified this force in transitions that I call the conductor. It's this force that seems to facilitate the transition for the dying. Well, when you have a, an individual on life support, it's like we're keeping him here or her, if that case may be, and they're waiting above the team, the loved ones, the welcoming party, the conductor, and all the other forces are just there in suspension, waiting for the release. It's spectacular. So, um, so yeah. And we even have situations when people do, uh, we, have, we have one case we feature where somebody chooses a physician, uh, or I should say medical aid in dying, and the welcoming party is surprised and rushing to get ready because it seems like, I mean, this is a very human interpretation, but we've seen this a couple of times that maybe Maybe they're arriving a little bit too early. Maybe there is a full course of a life that's anticipated. And not to say that physician or medical aid in dying is, is wrong in any way. I'm, I fully support that as an option. Mm -hmm. But those on the other side are working with a kind of life plan, perhaps, or a script that they've been given. And they're not always, at least all of them, completely dialed in to what's going on down here which is a bit perplexing. Uh, so there's a lot of mystery around this. And rather than you know, me trying to say we're, we're trying to figure this out um, or that I have figured it out, I'm more uh, so curious. I, there are some things that we can say quite definitively and there are some things that just leave us in this beautiful state of wonder. Wow, we know they know a lot, but do they know everything? Apparently not. I don't think so. I really don't. From the people yeah. I've talked to in so many different realms, I don't think our human brain can get the whole vastness of the universe and what happens. I don't even think once we get over there, we're going to understand it all. <laughs> I don't. Um, I wanted to ask, because I was just talking to somebody today about deathbed visions and people that in those last moments or the last day, you know, they're seeing their their spouse or their parent, or they're reaching up and, and they're smiling. The shared death experience, is there somebody alive who can also witness that? Is that part of it? Okay, let me see if I understand this. Okay. The, the first part you were asking about with seeing people reaching up um, as they're dying, this is usually caregiver, loved one watching, a loved one who's actively seems to be having a communication with the other right. side, maybe? Yeah, it is okay. there. Yes, 
Yes, because yeah. so many okay. people just before they die, they're mom or you know dad yeah. or the husband. Um, but I'm wondering if a part of the shared death experience is their loved one who's watching this, could they also be able to see who's reaching for their hand from the other side? You know what I'm getting at? Is yes. that possible? Okay, so <laughs> let, me, let me unpack this because okay. that first piece you're talking about is what is called pre-death visions or visitations. Okay. And that, that is not technically a shared death experience. Right. It's, di it's different. It's very similar, but it's a bit different. At least, you know, categorically, it's a little, a little bit different because what, what we as loved ones observe is just what you pointed out. Some sort of communication, some sort of dialogue, some sort of expression of reaching towards or engagement, gesticulation, honoring a conversation. The loved one in that case or caregivers are not privy or to the, the other person communicating. They may hear their loved one who's dying express and communicate, but they don't have access to the other side of that com communication. Gotcha. Okay, but still really great um, to be present for that. Uh, you know, if you can observe that in your loved ones, and sometimes the loved ones, the dying will come back and share with their surviving caregivers, loved ones. Hey, you know, this is where I was. Um, I was talking to aunt so-and-so. I was talking to my, you know, my partner or my sister or my brother, or my mother. And that's like really affirming if the loved ones can take that in as authentic. Uh, so, but it's documented and there's a good deal of research about that. When, when, okay, there's another experience right before, typically right after deathbed, pre-death dreams and visions, or I, I, they're really visions and visitations. They're mm -hmm. often called dreams, but they're, they're not dreams. They're not dreams. They're not dreams. If they happen during a sleep state, we have a tendency to call them dreams, but they're not dreams. They're distinct, they're distinct from dreams. Uh, so there's another experience that happens often right before uh, a death, and that is what we call terminal lucidity. And that is when the dying somehow have a, a rally. Uh, they rally in a certain way. Their physiological functioning increases. So if they've been uh, what we call non-responsive in a more you know, comatose state, if you will, slightly unconscious, they'll come to they'll be alert, they'll wake up, they'll perk up. They'll even have conversations with the various people in the room and can even tell them what they're doing and ask them about things like, hey, how's your tennis practice going? Hey, I saw that you did. They can actually cite events that were going on when they were in an unresponsive state. This Amazing. is remarkable. This is remarkable. It leads the uninformed to say, oh my gosh, grandma's coming back you know she's but actually the literature tells us that this is a harbinger for death so it's it's the it's the rally before death essentially uh, and oftentimes you can see somebody uh so that's one type of terminal lucidity there's another type that has been actually been made a bit famous by some um public figures you know steve jobs when he died for example his sister, Mona Simpson, describes seeing him open his eyes, and he had not had his eyes open for a number of days. So there you see that, there you see that, what I just talked about, that unexplainable physiological response, which seemed to be impossible, opens his eyes, looks up, alert, and says, oh, wow, oh, wow, oh, wow. He seems to be seeing something, and then he dies right away soon after that, moments later. So there, these are known in the literature uh, and cited. And these are other experiences. When you observe those, you get the sense that the dying are seeing something amazing. Like, and they're looking into the next dimension. Because when you see that, they typically die very soon. And I have many examples of that, both in our research and in personal experience. Uh, having been with people who died, I just remember being... Uh, 
being with a friend and as she was dying, uh, she was unresponsive and she, we pulled off the oxygen and we knew she was going to die momentarily. And all of a sudden head straightens out, eyes perk up and she expresses amazing, amazing. And she died. There it is, right? There. I mean, it's so clinical. I mean, so clinical. So one of my uh, friends. So yeah, now I'm so I'm gonna I'm giving kind of a no, it's okay. lecture here about these phenomena, but they're all part, I should say, we at the Shared Crossing Research Initiative study all of these phenomena. And I created a continuum. It's called a it's actually called the Shared Crossing Spectrum of End of Life Experiences, and it has to do with these experiences that happen that communicate across that suggest communication across the veil before death and then at death with the shared death experience and then after death with various forms of uh post-death communication and synchronicities throughout you know pre-death during death after death all suggesting that there's some communication happening across the veil so when you ask a very specific question that I'm trying to get back to, and that is, if you're observing somebody doing this, having this community, you're a caregiver loving, you're observing someone having this communication, can you actually see the person initiating or participating on the other side of the dialogue? Well, we do have some examples when, for example, you observe a pre-death communication or a pre-death vision or visitation, we do have some people who are able to sense, and in some very rare cases, see the, the person. More likely than not, they sense, for example, that was my mother. I feel my mother here. And one case, this is really interesting, uh, another case that, I, this is actually one that I was working with. I'm with a woman who's dying, and all of a sudden, I'm with her and I smell smoke, cigarette smoke. And I say to this person, I can say her name, Nancy. I go, Nancy, Nancy, I smell smoke. And she looks at me and she's got her eyes closed. And she opens up. She goes, yes, that's my mother. She's here. Her mother's dead, of course. Yeah, of course. And, and there, there you have it. And, and, and now I didn't see her. But I got what you call an olfactory experience, a sense of smell that was a type of indication of who she was talking to. Um, and wow, was that for me? Was that for Nancy? I don't know anything about that. But it was confirmation that her mother was present, was there. And you were sharing in that experience. And I was sharing in that experience. Now, that would be what we call a shared crossing, mm -hmm. because remember, the spectrum of end of life experiences are what we call shared crossings. They're all, we're all sharing in some of gotcha. this communication across the veil. Yeah. So I'm going to show off your book. You guys were kind enough to send me a pre-copy and congratulations. Thank you. Um, it's beautiful. Beautiful. I remember when we met, I was taking notes like crazy and I had asked you if, you know, you could be trained in this and learn how to do it, to be part of somebody with their experience. And um, yeah, you said yes, but I, I couldn't be more excited that now it's in a book that I know full training is something else, but that we can really learn more about it. And can you talk about what the benefit would be to people learning about this if we do have a loved one that is close to the end or even for our own passing? Yeah, so this is this is a great question. Like, you know, well, what's so great about the SDE is the first question. Like, is it what are the benefits if you have it? I mean, you're assuming that people want to have the SDE, which I I'm share with you. I had them and they're just spectacular. Yeah. But what I would say is this is that is that the benefits of the SDE, people need to know about them because when you have an SDE you have a sense that your loved one is alive and well in a benevolent afterlife. And I wouldn't say sense that you have a knowing that they're alive and well in a benevolent afterlife. That's There's fantastic. no doubt about it. 
That's such good news. Yeah. So, so there, there, there is your, and you know, I should say, this is why when I first started working with Raymond, I said, I want to teach people how to do this because everyone needs to know this is possible. But what I didn't understand was that people didn't really know about the experience. I thought once we explained it to them, they would go, okay, I want to have that. Well, there was so much doubt about the possibility for an SDE that I had to go back and do the research that we've just completed to document the SDE and to really give it the first comprehensive typologies and feature list and I'll break it all down in the research so you can see what exactly we're talking about that's so spectacular here. So the other benefit you have is your uh, apprehension, fear or anxiety about death diminishes, if not goes away completely. And this is very similar to the NDE. You know, people, persons that have NDEs have no fear of death. Uh, and, and that, you know, I'm one of those too. So uh, it's not that you, it's not, it's more that your, your fear of death just goes away. It just doesn't, it's not, it's not any effort. It's just like, oh, dying's easy. You know, I mean, what actually dying isn't so easy. <laughs> death is easy. Dying right. in an over-medicalized system can be quite difficult, actually. <laughs> but you know, but the actual transition itself, easy. Yeah. Uh, and so another benefit of the SDE is that you have this sense that you'll see your loved ones again. And that's a real gift. So you realize that in a certain sense, they're going away, but it's temporary. There will be a reunion at some point. And it'll be a joyous reunion because a lot of people sense the joyous reunion that in their SDE, when they see their loved ones get greeted by a welcoming party of other deceased loved ones, they know that, oh, that's how it works. So not everybody, you know, SDEs have a variety of different features, which I can go over. So they're not, you know, you know not everybody gets the same experience. But they get enough of these um, experiences that suggest what I'm asserting, which is that the, after, the afterlife is benevolent, that there is no reason to fear death. People tend to get this added benefit, which is their grief is much different. They can reconcile with the loss of a loved one with a greater sense of ease. Not that they don't miss their loved one. When, you, when a loved one dies, there's no way of getting through that heartbreak. You get it, but there's a larger context to hold it. And so it's, more, it's filled with more meaning. And then the other piece worth noting is that people have this sense that their life has meaning, that a human life has meaning, and they get about uh, the business, if you will, with, with a sense of urgency. I have to, I have to, I have to do what I came to this planet to do. And so there's a, a sense of clarity, almost an awakening about the importance of a human existence. Wow. It sounds like some of the things that happen with a near-death experience, but near-death experience, people go through some traumatic stuff. And to be able to get that result another way and get that sense of urgency to live. And I'm sure people go on to serve other people. So many people that have had near-death experiences want to give and want to share and want to help people. Um, yeah, William, what can we do or is there something we can do to increase our likelihood of having one of these experiences? Great question. And as I said to you earlier and to your viewers, <laughs> this was the first, uh, this is the first thing I said to Raymond is, I think I know how to make these things happen. So let, let me tell you what we've learned from the research, from my experience working clinically with folks, is that it's really important to address any of our unfinished business with people. Uh -huh. Why is that important? Because as we're dying, our psychic structures, our ego structures that defend us against some things that we might not have done that well in life, you know, maybe we weren't kind to somebody or weren't the best partner or whatever. Life is complicated right. and hard, so we make mistakes. If we, as our ego structures weaken, those 
regrets come to the surface. And it's no longer important that we defend ourselves. What's important is that we heal. So to the extent that we can heal our relationships here and now while we're alive is the extent to which we create the right conditions that allow us to die with ease and grace without resistance. Because ultimately it's acceptance of our death that allows us to have a transition of ease and comfort. Now that also allows for something else. When we can assert to our loved ones who are at our bedside or presumably will be preparing with us, we can say, I, I'm at peace about dying. I wanna thank you for having been my friend, my partner, what have you, my family member. I wanna thank you for the time we've had together, but I wanna acknowledge that I will be dying sometimes, probably sooner than you. And I wanna tell you goodbye. I don't wanna miss the moment to say, thank you, I love you, goodbye. With that, we open into a new territory. And that territory is a real peace it's, it's, a, it's, a, it's a higher frequency of truth in a certain way that allows for communication to, to happen in this space between the dying and the loved one. Now, I, there are also other protocols that are really beyond the scope of this interview because we've learned some things about how it is that you can train yourself as the person transitioning to, um, in a certain sense, incline your mind with certain thoughts, intentions, practices to, as you transition, as you leave your body, as you drop your body and ascend, because that's what we've seen, that's what the reports say, is that people ascend out of their human body. Mm -hmm. We have methods that can uh, connect or reconnect to loved ones in a in a positive way, in a, in a meaningful way. And I should say, actually, in an accurate way. These methods uh, tend to facilitate this. How accurate are they? Well, we don't have enough people dying to really try them out. I mean, you, right. you need a lot of people to die to, to, to demonstrate and test your the efficacy of these. But I can say anecdotally, about 50% of the people who've gone through our trainings will have either a shared death experience or some other profound shared crossing, a visitation or, yeah, usually it's a visitation post-death if it doesn't happen uh, at death, in which case it would be a shared death experience. So a good deal of our, uh, you know, of our trainees will, will say, you know, well, I didn't have the shared death experience, but my mother returned to me and it was spectacular. She told me, she was well, she looked younger, she was healthy, she was vibrant. She said she'd watch over me and she'd stay in touch. I'm like, wow. Okay, so yeah, about 50% will have an SDE. I'm gonna say about 80% will have some other phenomenon that is quite meaningful on our shared crossing spectrum. Oh, that's really good, good stuff. I know from my own training and experience, the magic happens in the present moment. And from what you're talking about, when you can have those conversations that need to be had, then towards the end, all that's there is love and being present. And I can't help but think without having the ego mind popping in, you are so present and so clear. I mean, it just opens this doorway for these experiences. Yes, you nailed it. You just articulated the conditions for the dying and for the caregivers. The dying can initiate and say, I'm comfortable. I'm okay with dying. I just want to die in this way, like usually at home or you know, with proper pain management. And to the extent that the caregivers and loved ones can accept that and not cling, if they can join and affirm a natural death, 
Yeah. That's ideal. Now, of course, you know, some deaths aren't natural. Some deaths are sudden and unexpected. Although in the modern era, increasingly, you know, deaths are more this slow kind of uh, death. Yeah, we don't, you know, certainly, yeah, there are, there's less cardiac arrest, for example, than there was, say, 40 years ago, and less strokes, you know, and things like that. But there's still car accidents and tragic, you know, uh, accidents of sorts. But by and large, most of us will have the opportunity to choreograph our deaths in a certain way. Yeah. And it's something we're all going to go through. You know, it's always been such a taboo t subject to talk about. And, you know, a lot of the people that pass, they're older and they're in homes or in hospitals. So it's not like a regular thing we see, but it is so normal. And to be at that place where we know the reality of the afterlife, we know that there's going to be loved ones and people choreographing our crossing. Um, and to be able to share that with that freedom and ease. And it's just like somebody going on vacation and they're going first and we have to wait a little while before it's our time to go, um, but they'll be right there waiting for us. Yes, I like that analogy to a vacation because yeah. people go away on vacations and then we see them again, they come back. We do. And there's somewhere where the communication isn't strong with the telephone. You know, they're in one of those distant places, but we know they're fine, alive, well, healthy, whole. So what do you hope, William, that people get out of reading the book? Just show it off again, because it's a beauty. Thanks. <laughs> I hope that the shared death experience is normalized, that people realize these experiences happen. They happen in healthy minds. They happen with, in, with healthy people. They're more common than we know and that there are steps we can take to enable them. Beautiful. And in, in, in a certain way, I, I can't say that an, an SDE is is a birthright because we don't know how many people have them. Mm -hmm. But there is a correlation between people who have them and their sharing with us that they have meditation practices, spiritual practices, prayer practices. We see that people who uh, are in what we call flow states are more able to have them. So an amazing number of people uh, will report that they were in the passenger seat of a car when they had it. Well, that's really interesting. That's a very receptive state that they're in. They're just, they're just kind of being driven around. Nothing's being asked of them. And they are having this experience. So there's a receptivity. So uh, the reason I share these is because we both know that they happen um, in, a, in these states of receptivity with a higher proclivity, higher probability, but we also see them happen when people are sleeping and they're awakened by a departing loved one to share in this experience, oh. to have the shared death experience. We also know that time and space are no um, limiting factor. In fact, we were stunned to see that about 64% of NDE, uh, excuse me, SDEs happen remotely and not at bedside. So these are all reminders that wherever we are and whatever we're doing, if we know, ideally, if we know that we have loved ones that are dying, if we can communicate and open our heart and just stay mindful of their experience, you know, that we know they're dying or that they're, even if they're elderly or if they're on a trip or some sort of doing some sort of experience that's a bit uh, risky to pray for them, to, to stay mm -hmm. in contact with them. I think these are factors that facilitate. They don't guarantee an SDE. We don't know enough about it yet. It's still largely a mystery. 
Mm -hmm. But we see these factors over and over again in our research. Do you still train people? I remember you were doing yes. the you know, different programs. And I know we've had a the past couple of years have been crazy with COVID and people being housebound. Um, so I bet some of that slowed down. But can you talk about the programs that you've yes. done or you're anticipating doing? So you're correct in that pre-COVID, we did all of our programs in person. And during COVID, we have taken the time to uh, reboot our programs in a certain way. And we will be launching a series of programs in 2022 that will, our Pathways program is the, was, I'd say it's our flagship program. Mm -hmm. And that program, that program will, will be coming up, not right away. I only mentioned it because a lot of people ask about the Pathways, but right. it's the program that prepares people for what we call a conscious, connected, and loving end of life experience. And we train in the protocols that, that enable the SDE. But we'll have a few other courses that will come out right in the beginning of 2022 that will help people understand in more depth the SDE. So there'll be a, a kind of a, an SDE 101 course that we're putting together right now. And I'll also do a course with Raymond Moody uh, in the beginning of 2022. So stay tuned. And that's only in a, in a couple of weeks now. So um, you'll, you'll, you'll have, if you're, if you're interested in your viewing, come to our website and you'll get more information. And then a big program we're offering is the Shared Crossing uh, Practitioner Certification Program. And that's for people who really want to assist others uh, in transitioning and, and knowing the protocols to enable these experiences. So this is for, this can be for any caregiver loved one, really. Mm -hmm. Although the interest we've had has come from death midwives, death doulas, hospice workers, nurses, uh, chaplains, people that really work intimately with uh, end of life. But like I said, we already have a good deal of inquiries from people uh, who just realize they're gonna be caregiving for loved ones and want to know this. And it's, you know, we haven't nailed down the hours on it, but it's gonna be about 40 to 50 hours online, interactive, a lot of guided visualizations, a lot of fun activities. And, and I say fun, they are fun when you get to, uh, you know, work with other people who are genuinely interested and, and have had some of these experiences. Most people find that uh, these programs are not just enriching, but they're really, I want to say they're a bit enlightening about what's possible. So just amazing. And sharedcrossing.com, is that the best way to keep an eye on what you got going on? Yes. Thank you. And you're on Facebook and probably all kinds of places, but I think that's Facebook, Instagram. Oh, everywhere. Yeah. <laughs> I want to share just a story because you just said uh, chaplain. Um, a friend of mine, Steve Kearney, just passed a couple of weeks ago, and he was a hospice chaplain. And I knew him from when I was catering for race car teams. He would do the services at, at uh, races, the um, Christian services. But he had told me a story about when his dad passed. He had been in a coma, very old, not healthy at all. And on one particular day when his adult children were around the bedside, he opens his eyes. He's all connected. He sits up in his bed. He swings his legs over and everybody's like, dad, dad, slow down. You know, what are you doing? And he says, it's so beautiful there. And he's looking and he's naming off his friends that he sees there. And one of the friends he named off died while this guy was in a coma and nobody ever told him he was there. So he, you know, the son said, you know, do you see Jesus there? No, no, I don't, but I know he's here. And, you know, well, what are they telling you? It's just that I have very short time left to just enjoy everything I can because I won't have this body for too much longer. So for the next week, he wanted a hot fudge sundae, an apple pie. He wanted to wear a suit and he wanted his family to be together watching his hometown uh, football game. And so they did all that. And on Christmas Eve, he said goodnight and he passed. 
And his kids, without a doubt, you know, knew where he was going, knew he would be just fine. And his son, who just passed a couple of weeks ago, he was older, he was a hospice chaplain. And, you know, he could share that story. There's nothing to fear. It's going to be the most glorious adventure of our lives. But we do have work to do while we are here. <laughs> so we don't want to go too soon. But, oh, William, is there anything else you want to share before we wrap up? I've really enjoyed this. Well, thank you. I just want to say that's such a beautiful story. And, and that is, that would be, that's the question you asked earlier. Are there times when loved ones can share or somehow share or gain access to a pre-death vision or visitation? In that example you just gave, this uh, chaplain's father was having a pre-death vision and a visitation visited by relatives and friends. Yeah. And he was able to share it with uh, his son, chaplain, who was chaplain. This doesn't happen very much, but when it does, as you've just <sighs> identified, it is so beautiful. And uh, what's interesting is some people will ask, well, why wouldn't that be a shared death experience? Well, the only reason it's, it's a shared crossing experience, right? Because, but the reason it's, we don't put it in the category of shared death experience is because that person, this father has not begun their journey. They need to be embarked on their journey and moving. And at that point, you're sharing in the transition. Everything else is before. And gotcha. when you get a, and when you get a visitation afterwards, you'll notice that they're not journeying anymore. They're coming back to visit us. That's why it's a post-death visitation or vision. They're coming back to visit us, but they're done with their journey. They are already relocated in this other dimension. Uh, and so this is, this is how we work with it. You can see that we spend a great deal of effort to identify the features right. So that we can have a map that really helps people. But you know, the important thing is, is not so much the categories, but is the validation and affirmation of these experiences as real, authentic, profound gifts to the loved ones. Beautiful. Any closing words? Well, just thank you for having me. And I love uh, the natural conversation here. And always good to be with you. And I know you have so many wonderful viewers. So I just encourage them to um, you know, look us up and, and thank you for considering buying the book. The stories are really amazing. Um, you know, we've had so many to choose from and I just feel so blessed to have had the opportunity to write the book. So. Oh, well, thank you, William. Love you so much. Oh. <laughs> and for our listener or our viewer, thank you for spending the time with William Peters and myself. Uh, remember the website, sharedcrossing.com. You can go to your favorite bookseller and pick up at heaven's door and learn more. And as a reminder, our home base is we don't die.com. I know grief and having a loved one pass is something that seems to unite most of us, most of us that are looking for evidence of the afterlife. There's a loved one who's gone before us. And I'd like to give you a free PDF copy of my book, We Don't Die, if you'd like, which also contains chapter 10, which is how to survive grief. Getting some tools to understand that process really helps. So go to wedontdie.com, scroll down. There's a place to join my email list if you'd like. And you get a, it says a free, few free chapters, but it's the whole book. That's the secret. And if you like listening to audiobooks, if you go to the store page there, you can scroll down, use coupon code free, F-R-E-E, -E, and get the audiobook, my gift to you. And if you enjoy these episodes, share. Why not? It's just a simple button on Facebook or Twitter or however, an email away, because I think most people show their happy self and what's behind their eyes could be somebody who is not only got a loved one who may have passed, but also they might be dealing with something pretty hard. And it really helps to hear these conversations because believing in the afterlife really helps us appreciate life and realize that our life is for a reason. And so 
when you think of the people with the shared death experiences, even if we haven't had one or haven't had a near death experience, we can take that advice to get busy. You know, our life is for a purpose. Follow your passions, reignite, and rethink about what you love. You know, do that for me, will you? I hope so. So, in closing, my name is Sandra Champlain. I've always, I'm always so delighted to be your host on We Don't Die Radio. I do believe that life is an education for the soul and that your life here is important. So, I really want to thank you for listening or for viewing, and we'll see you soon. <laughs>